organizers, uh, especially yourself, for inviting me. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? And my, uh, can you see my screen and uh, my mouse? Oh, please, yeah. that's all great, thank you. So today I'm very happy to talk to you about a series of work uh, that started with uh, linear fold. Uh, that was two years ago at ISMB. That was my first paper in, well, first paper in you know, ISMB. And then we, we developed a, a series of following up works all the way to uh, linear design which is very useful in, in the fight uh, against COVID-19 to design better mRNA vaccine sequences. So um, the theme will be linear time algorithms because uh, that's what is needed for a coronavirus because uh, due to the very long genome now. So um, just a little bit of my, my, my background, I'm not a computational biologist per se. Uh, I was trained as a computational linguist uh, at University of Pennsylvania, even though my, my advisor at that time wanted me to, to actually apply computational linguistics to uh, coding and RNA folding. But I didn't like that direction at all. I kind of kind of quit uh, computational biology for good. <laughs> I thought like, uh, and for, for about 10 years, I didn't work on any computational biology at all. It was just a coincidence that when I moved to Oregon State, uh, I met uh, a colleague from uh, biophysics and biochemistry, and he asked me one day a random question, like, do you know this thing called uh, stochastic complex free grammar, which can be used for RNA, RNA folding? And he just asked that, you know, just randomly, but but that reminded me that all these 10 years that I worked on, you know, incremental parsing or linear time parsing, uh, that is studying natural language parsing, uh, the, the uh, figuring out the syntactic structure for, for like English or Chinese sentence, those algorithms and, and theory can be totally applied to RNA folding with very little changes because between the two modalities, uh, language and, and biology, even though they look very different on the surface, they actually share a lot in common uh, under, underneath, uh, that is in the mathematical foundations, because on the surface, they just have a sequence of words, you know, ACGU are, are just words of the RNA language, and you have just a very long sequence, a very long sentence of RNA. But on top of that, what we care about as linguists or biologists is really the structures. In linguistics, we care about the syntactic structure, like dependencies syntax, or, or, or constituency trees. But in RNA, we care about the secondary or, or tertiary structures, and the uh, same, same thing in protein. And to model those structures, we use context free grammars, and we use very similar algorithms in both, both fields. But it turns out that the same algorithms have been uh, in, in, in used in both fields for like about 40 years, you know, those like cubic time uh, CKY style dynamic programming algorithms. And, and I realized that what I've been developing in, in natural language processing, the linear time parsing or incremental parsing algorithm can be totally used um, to speed up uh, RNA folding uh, very significantly. Uh, so that was uh, ISMB uh, 2019 uh, linear fold and then a following up paper and the last ISMB uh, in 2020 on linear partition. Uh, but those two papers were very basic research, and I didn't know that uh, there will be anything useful in the pandemic, but then pandemic hits. And then we, we refo refocused our, our attention to the coronavirus, and then that led to linear design and linear turbo for using these ideas that I developed pre-pandemic, um, and uh, to use it for, to use them for mRNA vaccine design and to find you know, uh, critical targets in the, in the genome for therapeutics and diagnostics. So throughout this uh, journey, I've been very uh, fortunate to collaborate with uh, Dr. David Matthews from, from Rochester. He's been a great mentor and, and a friend to many of you in the audience. And, and Richard Das from Stanford Medical School um, was not is not a collaborator, but he's a longtime user of my software from like 2018 and 2017. Uh, it, like ever since he heard that, that I've uh, this idea of doing linear time RNA folding, even before I did anything or published anything, he would email me like every six months and say, have you done it? Have you done it? Please release the code. Please release the code. It turns out that he needs to use it in his eternal game, which many of you have played. Uh, and because uh, linear fold was the only linear time algorithm and he was, you know, asking players to design very long sequences. So that's why uh, they need our algorithm. So, so for example, on SARS-CoV-2, which is in the longest RNA genome, 30,000 nucleotides, our work only takes like less uh, than half, uh, less than half a minute to fold the full sequence, and popular tools need like much much longer because they run in cubic time. So that's that's the little background, and I'll just give you some um, uh, kind of uh, uh, hint why RNA folding is, is basically context free parsing for like English or Chinese. Well, so for, for you know for this audience, I, I I'm sure people know this. The input is just the ACGU sequence, and the output is a dot bracket 
format sequence, which is the secondary structure. Um, and if you look at that, you, you realize that they really look like the hierarchical structure like a tree, which we use in, in natural language processing called parse trees. And these dots uh, correspond to the outmost uh, pairs. And like these dots correspond to the middle pairs, which are you know this stem. Um, and these leaf nodes here and here and here correspond to the loops, right? So for example, these leaf nodes correspond to the, this, this hairpin loop and so on and so forth. So we can totally model RNA structure as, you know, as a parse tree, assuming no, no pseudonauts, no crossing pairs for, for sure for now. Um, and then we realized that the same algorithm that we've been developing in natural language processing, uh, the standard back uh, bottom up algorithm that parses the, the natural language sentence in cubic time and is the, the sentence stem number of words uh, can totally be used uh, to parse RNAs or to fold RNAs. And that was basically the case uh, before linear fold that people have been using this cubic time algorithm for about 40 years, starting from uh, Lucinov and Zucker, like in 1978 and 1981. So those algorithms, Zucker and Lucinov, are very much the same as the CKY algorithm we used in natural language parsing, because they, they consider each you know, individual nucleotide and then two nucleotides and three nucleotides and all the way to all the nucleotides. That's a bottom up dynamic programming algorithm. And that's too slow for, say, COVID. Uh, of course, I did not know that COVID when I developed this work, but I had the idea that we could speed it up by adapting my linear time algorithm for incremental parsing for English and Chinese. And how, how uh, and, and I will just show you the result. Uh, so as I said, you know, it's much faster for SARS-CoV-2 and it's you know, linear time, uh, whereas uh, uh, Vienna and, and, and the Contrafold and those you know, RNA structure as well, they scale cubically uh, at, with sequence length. Uh, and this linear fold V is the Vienna mode uh, in linear fold and the C is the Contrafold mode. But more interestingly, uh, even though the search is much faster. It's actually not just faster, it's actually approximate in the sense that it's not really uh, solving the exact search problem. We, we have to you know neglect some of part of the search space, which do not look promising. But even though it's pro approximate, it's actually better in terms of accuracy. That's kind of uh, contradictory, <laughs> most people think, especially on the harder, hardest problems, that is the longest family, like 16S and 23S uh, ribosome RNAs. <clears throat> and you can see that they, they have huge improvements in both uh, PVV and sensitivity. And also in those long range based pairs, which are longer than five, more than 500 nucleotides apart. And we, we all know that they are very hard to predict uh, for the current energy models and the current, you know, and, and machine learning models as well. Uh, but, but for those hardest problems, we've showed the biggest improvement. And I will just quickly talk about how, like the high level idea, how we did it. Uh, the details are not that important. So we want to fold RNAs in linear time. And that is kind of a scan from left to right. And uh, you can tag each nucleotide from left to right using either you know left bracket or a dot, which means that it's unpaired, or a right bracket, which means it's paired with somebody on the left. But that naive algorithm will be three to the n, where n is the sequence length, because each position you have three choices. And that will totally be too slow. That's exponential time. So we want to do dynamic programming. That is you know, uh, packing done by packing equivalent states. We just think that maybe this state and that state are kind of equivalent under some sort of uh, relations, and then we can collapse the search space down to a cubic time space. But this cubic time is very different from the cl classical bottom-up cubic time because it's left to right, and left to right is actually uh, makes a lot more sense because you know RNAs and proteins they do fold uh, kind of before the sequence the sequence is is, is completed, like right? so that they fold co-transcriptionally and co-translationally. The prefix that is just being made, it, you cannot predict, you cannot predict, pre prevent it from, from folding it onto itself, right? Even though the whole sequence is not, not available yet, right? Uh, and also it's very similar to incremental parsing as you know, as you hear me speak right now, you're doing incremental parsing in your brain. You don't like wait until I finish a sentence, you hit a button and say parse, right? Just like if you read a newspaper article, you don't wait until you, you, you read uh, the period to say, oh, I start to understand the sentence. You, you understand it along the way. So that's incremental parsing. Uh, and here we're doing basically incremental folding. And then uh, another, another idea is to add beam search on top of the dynamic programming space. And then you can get linear time, but you know that's not exact search. But as we showed it, it's actually okay for accuracy. So even though we only search for a very narrow kind of a segment of the search space, they actually contain exponentially many alternatives because each state here corresponds to like millions of states in the original 
enclave space, right? So like you, you can see the number of structures we considered is really exponential uh, with sequence stats, right? Even if we do very small beam search. Okay, so here's just, you know, a uh, historical overview of, 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 you know, these many different fields, linguistics, compiler theory, computational linguistics, and computer biology. And as I said, everything started with Chomsky's conic three grammar. And they were used to model programming language syntax and also natural language syntax. And then in the 1960s, we have CKY for, for parsing all conic three grammars, uh, independently discovered by three different people. And that was used, uh, it's very similar to what we used in Nussdorf and Zucker uh, after, after about 10 years uh, to start folding RNAs. But then the, the RNA folding field got stuck for about 40 years without knowing that you know, computational linguistics have moved along and computer science as well. So basically, uh, Knuth said, you know, this kind of cubic time algorithm is too slow to, to do compiling, right? So because you, you want to compile a, a C++ or Java program with you know, millions of lines, and you de definitely need linear time compiling, linear time parsing. So he developed AOR algorithm, which is a left-right algorithm that works in linear time, but only for a small subclass of conic three grammars. That doesn't work for, for like those natural language grammars or RNA grammars because they have ambiguities here, whereas, you know, you know, for, for programming language, they don't have any ambiguities at all. So Tomita uh, uh, generalized LR to be generalized LR that works for all CFGs in qubit time. Uh, but, and as I said, this qubit time is left to right, not bottom up, very different. And I finally did it uh, about 10 years ago uh, to, to do linear time uh, dynamic programming for all kinds of three grammars. And that's the basis of the linear fold algorithm. Uh, when you can uh, apply that back to the RNA folding, and you get you know the first major speed up uh, in the field of RNA folding in 40 years. So, so in 40, in for, for 40 years, they got stuck. With, uh, RNA folding field got stuck with uh, cubic time folding, the standard dynamic programming algorithm. And this is the first time we can you know, improve it to linear time without sacrificing accuracy at all. Okay, so I already showed you these results. You know, I just wanted to, you know, rest restate that they are actually more accurate uh, for the more difficult problems. And also, if you compare it with local folding, so local folding is the the the, the, the kind of a mechanism people will always do well, before a linear fold. That is, you know, you only fold a local window in a sliding local window, and that doesn't work at all. Like say for this 23s uh, E. coli uh, ribosome RNA. Because the local folding just you know cares about local structures, uh, whereas RNA folding has a lot of mistakes over the long range pairs. You know, we we also make a lot of mistakes, but but we also uh, get much better uh, long distance pairs and much less mistakes uh, overall. And we will see that for local folding, it's also used very often in COVID because you know, these standard cubic time algorithms does not scale to that scale. But we actually can do linear time global analysis for COVID, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, and so here again is the connection between the parsing and the folding that, as I said, uh, RNAs and proteins fold while being assembled. They fold co-translationally and co-translationally, um, even though they have to sometimes adjust their uh, prefix folded structure a little bit of when the more, more sequences are available, they have to kind of unfold and uh, refold, like you have to jump up through this uh, kind of energy barrier uh, to, to, in order to refill, but otherwise they got to fold kind of uh, into local local minimums, um, and they actually re evolve their sequences evolve to be incrementally folded, just like human language standards, like English and Chinese, evolve to be incrementally understandable. Otherwise, you know, we cannot talk incrementally, right? Uh, and that's some very interesting connections between the two fields, and that might explain why my linear time search, even though being inexact, can perform actually better, more accurately uh, than exact search in terms of accuracy against ground truth, not in terms of search quality. In terms of search quality, we definitely make search mistakes, search errors. But when you compare our results for digital structures with ground truth, we actually got more accurate structures. Uh, of course, that's because the uh, standard energy models and machine learning models are also not perfect. If they're perfect, then that, that will not happen, but they are highly in inaccurate. Uh, so our search actually kind of regulates some of the, the uh, missed, uh, errors in, in the energy models and, and the machine learning models. Okay, and I'll, I'll skip this slide uh, uh, for, for time's sake, but, but we, in case you have questions, you can come back to the connect, more connections between parsing and folding. Um, so I quickly uh, uh, talk about extension of linear fold to linear partition, and that is uh, another work we did in, uh, in last year's RSMB. So basically, in, 
linear fold, we only care about a single structure that's called the MFB, minimum free energy. Uh, and that is the minimum uh, energy structure among all these millions of alternatives. But we really care about is not a single structure because RNAs you know, don't fold into a single structure in, in equilibrium. Many RNAs fold into many, many different structures that they ha kind of have a little bit of a, a back and forth or, 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 or kind of a change in, in, in the structure like travel switches and so on. So we, we more importantly care about the whole ensemble, the whole Boltzmann distribution of millions of or, or billions of different structures. So we care. We lost your audio. Niang, we lost you. Niang. Niang, we cannot we we can no longer hear you. In your time, but uh, then classical metastasis is um, the the inside outside algorithm that uh, can solve uh, partition function quest, uh, question, very similar to classical MFB. And also in cubic time, we can do it in forward and backward, or actually actually inside and outside uh, for linear partition. And also, it's going to be linear time, much much faster than than Vienna and the punch code. Uh, and it, more interesting, you can see the results. This is the ground truth. Uh, and this, this local partially, again, local folding with RNA PL fold, you can see they only care about the local windows, lo local pairs. And the standard partition like RNA fold dash P mode uh, has a lot of mistakes, especially these, the red ones are uh, mistakes. Uh, the blue ones are correct, uh, especially the, the here, the long range ones. And our linear partition is much, much better. Same thing for, for uh, 23 SE coli. Uh, and you can see here because the sequence length is much longer than local folding is just um, ridiculous, right? You know, just, just local pair, local windows. Uh, and you can see it very clearly, right? So our, our stru global structure is much, much better. Uh, here we are not really operating one structure. We are operating the pairs, the, the probability of each pair, so that we can see, you know, we do have, you know, crossing structure, alternative pairs. It's not pseudo knots that we can, that we predicted. It's basically that we, we say, oh, these pairs, sorry, these pairs um, have some probabilities, and these pairs have some other probabilities that they, they co-occur in, in the ensemble, just like these pairs, and, and also uh, like, like yeah, these pairs as well. So that's the better thing about partition, because it, it contains much more alternatives than the single structure. OK, so that was my research before the COVID. But then COVID hits, and that changed everything. Our, our lives are changed, including our research focus. So we've been focused on linear design, that is an algorithm to design better our vaccine sequences, better MRI vaccine sequences. So um, here is the you know um, uh, COVID and, and MRI vaccine overview. So as you all know that you have been injected, and most of you hopefully in, in the audience have been uh, injected two doses of mRNA vaccines. I got uh, the BioNTech Pfizer one, and I got a very bad fever after the second dose. Many people got very bad uh, side effects. Uh, this was, you know, this why why is this the case, right? Because we all know that they have been hugely successful, but they got they suffer from one important limitation that still needs to be addressed. That is the chemical instability of due to the RNA, right? So as you know, mRNAs are fast; they have no risk of infection and no risk of integration. But because they're RNAs, they're fundamentally single stranded, mostly single stranded, right? Some sometimes double stranded, but largely single stranded, and because of that, it's not very stable. Chemically, so they got cut down into pieces in water or in, in, in your cells, uh, so that they, you know, they do not stay very long. They, they they cannot produce many proteins, and as a result, their immunogenicity is relatively low. So that's the reason why, um, you know, you need relatively larger doses like the ones you got from Moderna and, 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 and Pfizer, and that would induce side effects. And also because the instability, you need ultra low temperatures like the cold chain technologies for shipment and storage, and that increases the cost and uh, limits the limit uh, the availability to countries like uh, with with warmer uh, cultures or, or, or warmer template uh, temperatures, right? And and also like you know, many developing countries don't have the coaching um, uh, infrastructure, right? So our key question is how do you design more stable mRNAs 
uh, that can stay longer in your cells or, or out in mouse, uh, outside of your cells to produce more proteins, to promote more of the spike proteins, and in turn yield more uh, antibody response. You know, that's, that's our key question. So this is actually an uh, interesting story from Moderna to, to Stanford to us. Uh, Richard Dust, a longtime user of our software, um, you know, uh, told us this story. Like, like I, I actually emailed him, uh, e emailed him when the, the, the pandemic first started in January of last year. Uh, I asked him whether you know linear fold and linear function can, can help, and, and uh, how that internal you know game can help. Initially, he said he had no idea, but after two weeks, he emailed back that I have a great idea. You come to Stanford, and I will help. So we, we, we went to Stanford and he told us, you know, this story of mRNA vaccine and, and so on. He gave us lecture about that. Uh, we, we don't know anything about, we didn't know anything about vaccine or mRNA vaccine for sure. Uh, but, but in two hours, he, he convinced us that mRNA vaccine is the, the way to go. And it turns out that Moderna had asked them uh, previously, how do you optimize for stability? Because they have published a paper in PNAS right before the pandemic, without knowing the pandemic for sure, uh, but, uh, that shows quite shockingly that MRA stability, these two, like more stable MRAs with the better or higher protein yield. That was that was very intuitive right now, but it was by the time it was published, it was kind of uh, very surprising, very uh, anti-dogmatic. Uh, people used to think that MRAs needs to be unstable in order to go through the ribosome more easily uh, in order to produce more proteins. But actually, it's the MRAs stay staying longer, being more stable, uh, that is uh, going to produce more proteins. But Moderna did not have a computational way to optimize for MRA stability. They asked Riju Dust, and Riju talked to us, and he planned to use our linear code plus his eternal game and open new game called Open Vaccine, where players can design better uh, or more stable MRA sequences uh, for the spike protein, and then, they, then my linear code will, will, will run on it and tells you the energy. So if you got a better energy, you, you stay, otherwise you, you change your design, right, and so on and so forth. But in his office, I was thinking that we should so that probably still doesn't work. We should go another route that is the linear design directly to, to solve it computationally. And he did not believe in me, but but, but uh, eventually uh, he was convinced. Uh, so so now now his open vaccine game, uh, most players are actually starting with linear design uh, designs and then do uh, minor changes, uh, fine tunes. Okay, so here is the MRA design problem uh, in a mathematical setting. Uh, so it's, the problem is very easy. Everybody can understand it. So the spike protein is what we want to encode or, or, or translate to, right? So one design MRA sequences that can translate to spike proteins. But spike protein is very long. It has over a thousand amino acids. Uh, and each amino acid can be translated by multiple DNA or RNA triplet codons because of the genetic code, this uh, redundancy in our genetic code. So for example, uh, Vadian has four choices, leucine has six, serine has six, and so on and so forth. If you multiply all of them together, uh, you got a humongous number. Uh, 2.4 times 10 to the whatever, 600 something MRA sequences. Every single sequence there is a possible candidate, is a good candidate for, for the vaccine. Which one should you choose, right? And by the way, this number is much higher than the number of atoms in the universe. And if you like the sequence, like, like just consider one sequence a second, you'd, you take much longer than the life of the universe to finish, right? So you, you just cannot do it uh, like by enumeration. So we want to find the best sequence that is, according to Moderna's paper, the most stable one. In other words, uh, we want to find the thermodynamically low, lowest energy one, which is you know the most stable one uh, in this huge uh, ocean of candidates. But how do we do it? How do we search for that, right? And the answer is something that is rooted in, in the first half of this talk using conic free grammars and plus finite state automata. That's another two of um, from, finite, uh, from formal language theory. Um, so here's the, just a quick result, and this is the wild type that is the original sequence in the virus. It's very unstable. You can see that it has a lot of uh, single-stranded regions, uh, very, not very good energy. After about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes of our optimization, we got a completely different structure, different sequence as well. But they both encode the spike protein. So this sequence on the, and the structure on the right is the lowest free energy state uh, and most stable. Uh, you can see they're mostly double-stranded in the sense that it almost becomes like a DNA. Right, uh, with some you know some single strand regions, but very few, and uh, it's, you can imagine it's very hard to be cut down, right? So we actually test you know these sequences like that uh, also in, in wet lab experiments. Um, so, but just you know a quick uh, theoretical uh, slide how we did it. You know the, the basic idea is that we represent you know the choices of, 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 of genetic redundancy as a, a 
DFA or finite state automaton, like say the, the four choices of radian, you can represent this way. The six choices of a Syrian, you can represent this way. And then you can candidate all these little DFAs together. You've got a very long protein DFA. And then each sequence, each path along, through the protein DFA is a valid sequence, right? So even though there are like 10 to the power of, you know, whatever, 600 something possible sequences, you compactly represent them in a small DFA. Uh, they contain exponentially many paths, right? So now the question is, how do you choose the best path? Well, we know that we want to choose the one with the lowest free energy according to the uh, RNA holding free energy model, and we can represent them as you know stochastic quantized free run. That's the old stuff that I talked about in the first half of the slide uh, of this talk. But then the crucial second idea is that we realize that in order to find the best path, you, you cannot enumerate them one by one and be parsing. That would take too long. You kind of inject them, you superimpose the conic free grammar on top of this DFA. And then what, what happens is you basically got an intersection of the CFG of the conic free grammar with the finite state automaton. And that is actually a classical concept in the theory of computation and computational linguistics. That was solved actually 60 years ago. Wow. So 60 years ago, people already know that we are, we're going to, to have this pandemic and have this MRI design problem. <laughs> and then, then, you know, actually there's a very efficient algorithm that can solve it in cubic time if you design a programming, right, according to this theory. So, and a classical single sequence body like uh, Zucker and, 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 uh, and Lusnov, it's basically a special case of this theory where the DFA is a single chain. So imagine you have a single RNA sequence. You can just represent it as a DFA as well. It's just a special DFA that you know is just a single chain, and you can do this intersection as well. So, so what we have done in RNA folding is a, just a very simple special case of this huge algorithm. Right? We, we did not realize that, but actually the theory is already there 60 years ago. So now uh, we we can you know optimize for energy, but that's not the end of the story. There's another half of the story that is to put on formality or translation efficiency. Moderna's paper showed that you also want to prefer uh, frequent codons in the human on usage table, for example, leucine, you want to prefer CTG because that's used 41% of the time. You want to not prefer, you don't want to use PTA or UUA, which is only 7% of the time. So some codons are rare codons, some codons are frequent codons. You want to use frequent codons as much as possible because that will increase your translation efficiency. So that's actually a two-dimensional uh, optimization. On the left, you want to do the lower the better uh, energy, and on the on the y-axis, you want to higher the better. Uh, that is more efficient translation. And then you can have a limit, uh, you have a lambda, that is the, the uh, importance of CAI, importance of formality, and that's the limit of your, that's the limitation curve or boundary curve, you know, because you want to push towards top left, but beyond this curve, uh, nothing is possible, it's an infeasible region, but underneath this curve, everything is possible, and how many possible candidates are there, so, so many, right? And wild type just one of them here, and the CI greedy design where lambda is infinity, that is you only care about translation efficiency, then that's also a very easy solution. Uh, and our most exposed design is the most left here. And this, this everything here is needs to be explored, right? So it turns out that vaccine companies like Moderna and, and Biontech Pfizer, they only care about the traditional technique called code optimization. That is, you know, you just choose better codons, you prefer better codons, prefer higher GC content, prefer you know better uh, CI codons. So they, they're very, very close to CI agree design, uh, but they did not explore anything that is left of this line that is huge uncharted area. That is, nobody knows that they exist because they have no algorithm to, to, to go beyond this point to, to optimize for energy directly. And more interestingly, after the, the encyclical party is published, uh, many companies, many you know vaccine companies contacted us and they wanted to test our designs in vitro and in vivo, and one of them uh, it's called Stamina uh, in the next few slides. They actually did a lot of wet lab experiments already and showed that this part actually works um, a lot better than than, than population. So here's the first part of the wet lab results. Uh, uh, by the way, how, how am I doing on, on time? Uh, am I supposed to uh, finish in five minutes or uh, um, do you think? Um, um, go on. Uh, we'll, we'll have a little extra time on okay, the ask you. question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll speed up. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we designed about seven, seven designs uh, using our algorithm, and also the baseline uh, is the code optimization baseline, very similar to BioNTech's and Moderna's. That's from that company called Stamina RNA in Shanghai. Uh, and then we tested their stability using gel runs, and you can see they match very well with our thermodynamic energy. So that A is the most stable, H is the least stable, and you know, they are in between. 
and also you can measure in solution stability, like how much percentage of the RNAs are still intact, meaning full length. Because only full length RNAs are used, right? Because if they're cut down to pieces, they cannot produce the spike protein that you wanted. So the most stable design lasts the longest. Uh, if you take the day four, and that's the, 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 the you know, remaining, uh, the H is zero percent. H is already gone completely, and A is still 35% remaining, and so on and so forth. And then we look at protein expression, and our most stable, our, our design is also better than, than baselines, and the, the baseline. And most importantly, we, we care about the immune, immunogenicity, the, the, the antibody response, or the level of protection that you have after injecting the vaccine. So we tested on six mags per design. Uh, day zero and day 14, they got two shots. Like this is the second booster shot. And after another 14 days, we tested blood samples for uh, IC50 titer, that is the uh, neutralizing antibody titration, uh, the higher the better. Uh, H, we can see the baseline is basically nothing. And our designs are much, much better. Like, so for example, C here being the best are about 20 times better than the baseline. And the other ones in the A, B, D, they are also about 10 times, nine times better. Right, so they're all significantly, very, very significantly better than, than the baseline with, without using our algorithm. Um, but you might wonder, like, you know, Modern and BioNTech use some other technology called, uh, you know, pseudouridine modification or chemical modification. And we tested the H prime, which is the chemical modified version, pseudouridine modified version of H. And they are indeed a lot better. And that's actually, you know, very similar to the, the real product and very similar to, to the Moderna's product and BioNTech's product. They're actually significantly better than our design. But we didn't explore the space very, you know, very seriously, right? We could have done a lot more, like, you know, a hundred more uh, designs here and there. And we can imagine that around here, that there's definitely something that's better than, than, than uh, the H5. And also, these two directions are completely orthogonal. That is, you know, a combinatorial design and the chemical modification. They can be used together. It's just that we don't have a chemically modified energy model. We are waiting for that energy model uh, from our collaborator, David Matthews. Uh, but actually, uh, some companies like Pureback doesn't use chemical modification at all. They, they basically use something like, like this, but they did not have our algorithm. So if you don't use chemical modification, people know that uh, you're not going to be as good as, as you, uh, if you use chemical modification. But if you use our algorithm, then uh, things will be different. They, they could possibly be uh, equally as equally good. Or if you can, you know, if you have the energy model, we can you know, have a drop-in replacement. We don't need to change any line of the code. We just change the energy model then we can design, re-optimize in the uh, chemical modification model, then that will be uh, probably the best. So that, that's future work. Okay, so uh, for the remaining time, I will quickly talk about another uh, project uh, that is uh, diagnostic, that is making tools for diagnostics and therapeutics, not just vaccine, vaccine for protection, but what if you already have it? Or uh, what if you have one test if, if you have COVID, right? So this is mostly my work, work with my student, uh, Sujan Lee and uh, our collaborator, David Matthews. Uh, it's called linear turbo. So why uh, COVID-19 needs linear time algorithm? I think I already convinced you that because they are very long and the standard typical time algorithm are too slow. But more importantly, new variants are emerging every day, especially you know, alpha, beta, delta, whatever. And they make the vaccines much less effective. Like if you read the, the data from Israel, uh, delta va uh, variant makes uh, the, the, the effectiveness much, much lower. And also it, they make testing, like PCR testing, much more difficult. Like a lot of the variants are initially not detectable, and after many, many testings, they are uh, negative, they become positive, and so on and so forth. So, we need homologous folding that is taking all the variants into consideration, fold all the, these variants of the genome together in order to find conserved regions, conserved, and not conserved regions, but conserved structures as critical car targets or actually skills of the virus that is the best for you know, diagnostics and therapeutics. And more importantly, hopefully, hopefully they would work in spite of existing mutations and even future mutations which we cannot predict but how can we make sure that would be the case when well, we look at historical data like you know bat, beta, uh, bat coronavirus and SARS-CoV-1 and if some regions are not even changing throughout the history uh, throughout the phylogeny then chances are that in the future they will not change either right because they are so critical they're so important for, 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 for the virus to survive that this part they, they're just totally critical and you know Without our algorithm, the current efforts on smalling SARS-CoV-2 all resort to local folding, as I told you, like s small segments of the, the sliding window, so, so that they ignore long-range base pairs, like from the beginning to the end. And also, they only consider one sequence, that is the reference sequence alone, ignoring all variants. So we're gonna have something that address both, that is a linear turbo fold, that you know, take 
several sequences, many sequences together, and fold them all together. So like joint, fold, and align. So the, even the alignment is also done, uh, you know, together with folding. So this is based on triple fold two, but we linearize it uh, and make it much more efficient so that they can scale to SARS CoV-2 coronavirus for the first time. And it's only two that can to scale to that scale uh, that can do harmonic folding or, or joint fold align. And they also like in linear fold and linear, uh, linear partition, they also does similar or slightly better in terms of, of both the folding accuracy and uh, alignment accuracy as well. So that's very interesting. And this data set that we're gonna use for the next few slides has uh, 16 very diverse SARS-CoV-2 genomes um, uh, from uh, up to the end of last year. And SARS-CoV-2 genomes do not have too many mutations so far. They have about 1% mutations because you know they, they haven't got enough time to mutate that, that much, right? So the sequence identity is 99%. But then we added some more distant relatives like SARS-CoV-1, and they are about 80% similar with SARS-CoV-2. So a lot of things have changed, but there's something more closer to SARS-CoV-2 that is the bat coronavirus. One of the bat coronavirus uh, found uh, in Yunnan, I think, has about 96 se sequence identity uh, to SARS-CoV-2. And the most striking results is that at, this is our prediction that is from five prime and six, uh, three prime UTRs. And that, that's the, the Huston et al. prediction. Uh, there's a representative uh, prediction using shape directed uh, shape data. So the, here, they use shape data plus like RNA structure uh, super fold, to, to fold. But then, because they use local windows, they cannot predict long range phase pairs that I, 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 I alluded to earlier. So their, their five prime and three prime do not connect. But actually, a recent purely experimental work from uh, MISCA's group, uh, they live in the area of MISCA, uh, showed that five prime and three prime have connections, have base pairs that cross like about 30,000 nucleotides apart, but they are very firmly uh, concluding that they're, they're together. Because as you know, uh, the, the five prime end of three prime end of RNAs, regardless of mRNAs or linked RNAs, they are usually very close in, 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 in nature. Uh, and we magically got this exactly same predictions, uh, same interactions in our purely in silico work without looking at any shape data, but just because we can fold globally, this is the first time that we can fold SARS-CoV-2 variants globally, uh, we can actually found the exact same five prime, three prime interaction across about 30,000 nucleotides apart. And also this is conserved in the sense that all SARS-CoV-2 genomes that we found uh, have this connection, have this five prime, three prime. Um, connection and also the, the the other structures are quite similar to the Huston et al data, but uh, but uh, but this is the very striking difference that only our work can produce. And then finally, we also look at accessible regions. Why? Because you know, like diagnostics, like PCR testing and sRNA eff efficacy correlates very well with uh, target accessibility. That is, the probability of a region being completely impaired in the uh, Boltzmann ensemble. Why is it important? Because if it's completely impaired, it's easier for sRNAs or, or you know, primers or whatever, guide RNAs to, to attach to them, to bind with them, right? Because if you have a lot of structure, then it's hard to open up the structure and have something else to, to, to attach to it, to, to bind with it, right? So if you're completely impaired uh, or high accessibility, like 0.9 accessibility, then it's much easier to open and to, to bind with some sRNAs or, or small molecules or, or guide RNAs or, or, or primers or whatever. So we use our sampling algorithm called linear sampling, which I didn't have time to talk about based on linear partition, to sample these structures from the Boltzmann ensemble in linear time according to their probabilities, right? And so that we can calculate their accessibility. And linear sampling, of course, is the only tool that can scale up to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so linear turbo fold uh, will get, will, will output modified partition functions and then linear sampling will, will sample them. So you can see that if you use single sequence folding, then like that is you fold each individual SARS-CoV-2 sequences alone, then they got very different structures, even though this region has no mutations at all. And as you know, SARS-CoV-2 hasn't had too much mutations uh, in, the, in, you know, in the global view, they have only what, about 1% mutations. And this green window that we showed here have no mutations. It's just like they have some mutation outside of this window that affected, that influenced the folding inside this window that they you know, got you know, totally different structures across the, the variants. But if you consider them all together in folding, that is, if, if you do, you know, uh, turbo fold, then they become totally the same, the same structure here, uh, because we encourage them to be 
coding similarly because they have to, right? If they are homologs, they code very similarly, uh, and they have very good uh, accessibility. Same thing for for this region that the frame shifting region, very important region in the coronavirus, and they we can see that they code very similarly, uh, and that's a very good target uh, for 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 drug design. So I'll I'll skip here that just showing that uh, we have very uh, a lot of good candidates for 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 diagnostics and, and therapeutics. They they range across the genome. And finally, I would just say that the entire time algorithms do work and they are needed. They're indeed needed for, uh, for COVID. Uh, we did not know it when we developed them for the first time, when, when we initially started to work on it, but um, they actually are indeed needed for SARS-CoV-2 and they do work and work very well. And uh, especially the, the mRNA vaccine design uh, is being used by a lot of vaccine companies right now, ma major vaccine companies throughout the world. And our leadership support can find active skills of the virus and hopefully um, that you can use it for diagnostic and therapeutic. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And we have our web servers and the source code released and the, the, the three unpublished work that I talked about, I have a preprints that you can you can take a look at. And I would like to thank my students and collaborators and thank you very much for your attention. I can take some.